Good morning and welcome. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for uh, being in control of this service from beginning to end. Uh, Lord, that you would open our ears, open our hearts, uh, allow us to be more like you. Father, that we could love more, that we could be strengthened by you, that we could want to and expect to receive something from you from heaven. So, Father, uh, anoint my lips and um, allow us to be uh, servants in your kingdom. Remind us that you are the potter and we are the clay. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, and let's not forget about the, all the teenagers that are traveling everywhere back home today. Um, one of the um, church buses from the Palmetto Point Church of God in South Carolina, they chartered a bus wrecked on the way there. The driver had a medical emergency. If you would have seen the pictures of the bus that went into the medium, and the only thing that stopped it from crossing onto the oncoming traffic was um, maybe about a three-foot, some, some wires and a couple metal poles. Uh, but all 38 youth walked off of the bus alive and well, and so did the bus driver. <clears throat> uh, which brings me to my opening. Um, back in the beginning of January, uh, right after Christmas, my wife and I traveled to South Carolina. Um, I love palm trees, if I haven't never told you that. <clears throat> but our church that's down there, uh, the Palmetto Point Church of God, Pastor Jamie Barfield, his wife Maddie, lovely couple. Uh, every year they do what's called a sacred season. A sacred season is when you take three weeks and you set yourself apart. Uh, you fast one meal a day. Uh, you get into as much of God's word as you can possibly get into. And um, what God laid on my heart, there was a couple things that, that I needed to set aside. Um, my national news app, I didn't look at it for 21 days. Uh, I could only look at local news. And that's just what God spoke to my heart. Um, and then uh, the other thing I gave up was um, country music for 21 days. I like country music, um, especially like in the morning, we'll start our day off, you know, with, with all of our praise and worship contemporary music. And then by about one o'clock and, and I'm still out seeing patients and I'm driving home, uh, I like to listen to country music. So I didn't get any country music for 21 days. Um, and the, the last thing that, that God said I needed to stay away from was my most favorite thing here on earth. It was McDonald's coffee. So for 21 days, I didn't have one McDonald's coffee. There were times when me and my friend Rob, he helps me uh, several days a week, when we would pull into the drive-thru and we were ordering other things. And I said, hey, Rob, look at, those, look at that in there. They're laughing at me. He said, what do you mean they're laughing at you? I said, look at those coffee cups. They're laughing at me in there because I hadn't had one in 21 days. <clears throat> so about a week into our fast, uh, God kept me up all night on a Sunday night. And he kept speaking to my heart uh, some deeper truths, things that I had trouble with in the scripture. That, and so my message this morning, really, it, even though I'm going to give it to you, it was for me. Um, he gave me three deep truths uh, as, as we look at the scripture that we're going to bring, be bringing up here. And it focused on helplessness. You know, in times whenever we just, we don't have an answer for the problem that we're facing, basically. Um, and I feel that Satan can use that as one of his tools. He uses fear and he uses pride and he uses anxiety and stress and um, selfishness. Uh, everything that's contrary to the kingdom of God, Satan can use to keep us from where we need to be serving Christ. And I, I think if Satan can get you to feel like you're helpless in a situation, then he's going to stop you from being productive in the kingdom of God. Okay, so the three truths. Um, next slide. <clears throat> our, our scripture verses are in Matthew, the 27th chapter. And I pulled out select ones because there were several that, you know, talked about different topics. 
what I really want to focus on is God the Father in heaven, the Son on the cross, and Joseph of Arimathea. Those three areas. Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 2750 says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then we go to 2757. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. 2759, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. So leading up to this, Jesus had to go before the high priest and the Sanhedrin, Ananias and Caiaphas. They had all these false charges of blasphemy just because he said he was the son of God. They drug him into Pilate, the governor, the Roman governor. Pilate didn't want to do anything because he didn't want an uprising, a re revolution in his town. Sent him to Herod and then sent him back to Pilate. That's whenever he released Barabbas. And Jesus was sentenced to crucifixion. But what does helplessness really mean? Helplessness is defined as, there's a slide for that, being unable to help oneself, weak or dependent, deprived of strength or power, powerless or incapacitated. I don't know about you, but that is something that can really, Satan can use to stop us from being productive. To be completely dependent, to not have strength, to not have power, powerless or incapacitated. Jesus was human. And I believe Jesus experienced every human emotion that there is. And if you Google it, you'll find that there are 271 human emotions. One of those emotions is helplessness. Yes, there's happiness and there's anticipation and, and there's sadness and there's anger. Um, but why helplessness? I feel that Jesus was tempted in every way, the Bible says, and yet he was without sin. So if Jesus was tempted in every way, I believe that Jesus had to experience all of the different emotions that a human being can experience. And one of those emotions was helplessness. We see in Matthew 27, 46, <clears throat> and for 20 years, this verse troubled me. Because I'm a father, I have two sons and a daughter. This verse says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I just wonder, has that verse ever bothered anybody but me? Being a parent, having a child, having provided for and protected my child their whole life? In the Greek, this word sabachthani, it means to move forward 
without. What Jesus is saying to the Father here is, my God, my God, why have you moved on without me? There was a time in Jesus' life when his earthly father moved on without him. Let's think back. Jesus was a young boy. His parents had went to the temple. They had finished. The Bible says that they left and that they traveled for three days and realized that they didn't have their son with them. His parents moved on without him. He experienced this before. So, think of this. They traveled three days away from Jesus. They traveled three days back to Jesus to find him in the temple, and he said, I am about my father's business. Jesus, all he wanted to do was please his father. Remember that. So there's six days of travel. And then guess what? After they get Jesus, they have to travel another three days to get back to where they were going. So instead of that trip that should have been three days, it actually was nine days. Three there, three back, and then three there. I never liked that verse. Since I first heard it 20 years ago, when we first asked Christ to come into our heart, I couldn't understand it. And I was a new parent then. My children were 10 and 6 and 4. God, how could you allow that to happen? And after that first week of fasting, when God kept me up all night, I said, God, I got to work in the morning. It's one o'clock. It's three o'clock. It's five o'clock. What he finally showed me was I loved him enough to leave him on the cross. And I never looked at it that way. I felt like it was a punishment. God the Father loved his son enough to turn his back, to move forward without him. That was the first that God showed me. The second one was Jesus. Here you are. You have already been through the trials. You've been beaten and whipped and mocked and spit on and made to carry a cross. You've had the nails in your hands. You're hanging on the cross. You have all authority in heaven and on earth. And the Bible says the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And I always thought, and we hear songs. Some of you that are 50 plus, you you might remember one of these. When When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Have you ever heard that? I used to think that, but God showed me something different that night. Jesus had one goal and one goal only. His, yes, ultimately he died to erase sin for all mankind, but his one goal was to please his father. The reason he didn't call the legions of angels to come and get him is because he just wanted to please his father. And being a son, I'm very familiar with that. It wasn't too long ago that I, my dad's best friend um, had called us and he needed some help with his wife. He had brought her home and 
we were completely out of staff. We're like every other business in our country right now. If you hire one person a month, you're lucky. And there were people that came from out of the woodwork and, um, and helped and kept this lady comfortable at home as she was struggling with cancer and hospice in the last weeks of her life. All I wanted to do was please my father. I completely understand that. If that verse wasn't in the Bible before I understood it, it would have been better for me. But now that God showed me that that verse was love and not punishment, I understand it a lot better now. And then there was a third truth. Matthew 27, 59 says that when Joseph had taken the body, first of all, he was a rich man. And it's okay for you to be a rich person and be a disciple of Jesus. So you remember back when Jesus was talking to a a rich man earlier in the New Testament? And he said, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And what did Jesus tell him? Go and sell everything that you have and then follow me. You see the difference between him and Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich man. His belongings served him. He didn't serve his belongings or his possessions. See, once you understand that it's, it's okay for you to be a wealthy Christian, because you understand that everything that you have, everything that you hold in your hands, it doesn't belong to you. That's why the rich man earlier couldn't follow Jesus because he was, he was serving all of his wealth and his possessions. They weren't serving him. So when Joseph had taken the body, back up a second, how much courage did it take for a disciple of Jesus to go to the ruler who just had him crucified, being his disciple saying, can I please have his body? Could I have done that? Would I have had the courage to do that? When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and he laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And what God showed me in this passage is that Jesus had to become completely helpless. He couldn't get from the cross to the tomb without help. He couldn't lift a finger. He couldn't move his mouth. He couldn't open his eye. He was completely helpless. He had to be carried. And I believe that happened because there's times in our life, in our walk, when we are so helpless that we need Jesus to carry us. And now he knows what it was like to have been carried. So he knows how to carry us. That was the third thing that he showed me. Jesus was helpless. And there were others that were helpless. If you remember in the Old Testament, just to name a few. Abraham and Sarah waited how long to have a child? hundred years. Isaac, his dad took him up to the mountain. He was the sacrifice. He was completely helpless. He didn't know that he was the sacrifice. Moses, Moses was put in a basket and pushed down a river. Completely helpless. Moses stood at the Red Sea when the Egyptian army was chasing after them, wanting to kill all of the Israelites. He didn't have an answer. He didn't have a solution. All the people under him said, let's turn back. It's better to be there and to go through what we were going through than to be stuck here at this sea. Jonah, what could be more helpless than being in the belly of a whale? Job. Job had a report that all of his children had died. He had a report that all of his 
cattle had died. He had a report that all of his sheep had died. Every earthly possession he had, other than his health and his wife, was taken from him in one day. What about the people in the New Testament that came to Jesus that needed healed? Remember last week, Pastor Kenneth talked about the paralytic. And his friends knew that Jesus could heal him, but they had to get him to him. And the crowd was so large, they had to rip the roof off and lower him down in. How do you think that paralytic felt his whole life? Not being able to move himself. What about the man beside the pool at Bethesda? Every time the angel came and stirred the water, he watched other people get their healing every time. And he never got his. One of our favorites, the lady with the issue of blood. The Bible says that it had happened for years that she had tried to get her healing and that she had spent everything that she had and still hadn't received her healing. How helpless was she? How helpless did she feel? They were all helpless, but they weren't hopeless. There's a difference between being helpless, not having the answer, not having the solution to the problem that you're facing, and being hopeless, which means there will never be an answer to the problem that I'm facing. Jesus was helpless, but he wasn't hopeless. And if you back up to when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's sweat like blood that's coming from his pores as he's praying to the Father, saying, If there's another way, let this cup pass from me. He didn't have a solution to the problem. But he knew that God the Father would keep his promises. In Mark, the ninth chapter, we have a slide for that one. Jesus was teaching and preaching throughout the land. They had left the place that they were at. They passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were. Because he was teaching his disciples, he said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. What got Jesus through the garden of Gethsemane and what got Jesus through the completion of the cross, giving up his ghost, he had hope. He knew that on the third day, God was going to raise him from the dead. Hope means the feeling of what is wanted, can be had. It's also defined as to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence. To believe, desire, or to trust. The times that we are helpless in our walk with Christ... We need to remember what he's brought us through in the past. Remember his promises that he has for us. Even when we don't see the solution. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How much are we trusting God as we're walking with him on a daily basis? There were three times that, that I can recall off the top of my head that I experienced helplessness. And all three times my wife was with me. 
So we experienced it together. My daughter was almost two years old. We had a company picnic in Ottawa Park. And we had one of those double strollers that had the roof on it that you could pull it back and there was plastic you could see or you could put it forward and you couldn't see what was underneath of it. Well, the roof was forward. And we left the the picnic area. We were going down into the park and we stopped and was looking at the old antique pictures and um, I was pushing the buggy at the time and then my wife grabbed the buggy and we turned and when she turned, it didn't feel right to her. There was no weight in the buggy. And she pulled it back and our two-year-old daughter was gone. I've never seen that look on my wife's face before and I've never seen it since then. It was a look of panic. It was a complete helplessness and I was the same way. Do you go forward looking for her or do you go back look for her? Do we split up? Do we stay together? She um, got the attention of the employees that were there in that area and her first thing she said to them was you have to shut the park down and my thought to her was if you're going to lose a kid this is the perfect place to lose a kid because there's nothing but families all around us so fast forward five minutes seemed like 10 hours One of my employees had left the picnic area, was walking down and saw her. She was running back to the picnic area, picked her up and brought her to us. But we were completely helpless for five minutes without our daughter. The next one. In May of 2019, I may have mentioned this before. um, Starting in the fall of 2018, my company got a new computer system. And I helped 110% to get this new computer system up and running. It started running in January. Once it was up and running, all my secretary said to me, okay, don't touch anything else. We got this. So all the data input was in. And then by May, I didn't know how to work the system. I didn't know how to use it. I had... Four secretaries leave in four weeks. So everything that my company needed to survive was thrown back in me and Dawn's lap. And I've never experienced an elephant sitting on my chest and anxiety and inability to breathe and my heart was racing. I never experienced that before. So I got in my car I put on Lauren Daigle and I drove around for a half an hour until that just was me and God and Lauren Daigle and she saved my life. That song Rescue, that song was for me. And then in, I'll tell you, we did hire a new girl in April right before and she's still with us. And My sister-in-law, who helped us start our company, came back to help us. And I had a crash course in our computer system in two weeks. And I was at least able to function. So God made a way where there was no way. That I I couldn't see past the problem that, that we were having. And then on March 13th, 2020, remember that's when the governor shut our state down. Well, we're essential workers. We had to go to work. We hadn't, there there were no vaccines back then. And um, the worst part about that day was they closed the daycares down. Well, guess what? Essential workers have kids. So on that day alone, my wife and I lost six full-time employees. So there were patients in four counties that had no one. So her and I started going out, making visits. We, we would uh, drive an hour to grocery shop for 94-year-old ladies. And then as the weeks went on, we would hire someone and then we could get back in the office. Um, the, the restaurant workers that were out of business, some of them came and helped us. Some of the teacher's aides, 
that were out of a job, they came and helped us. We were helpless, but we weren't hopeless. There's some scripture about before Christ died on the cross that I want you to just take a look at next. The Bible says that all of us were once helpless without Christ. In Romans, the fifth chapter, sixth verse, I want to look at it in the Amplified Version and then the English Standard Version. Romans 5, 6 says, While we were yet in weakness or powerless to help ourselves, at the fitting time, Christ died for in behalf of the ungodly. And another way to look at that in the English Standard Version says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were helpless, but we weren't hopeless. In 1 Peter, there's a promise, 1.13, that says, Therefore, with the minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So not only do we have the promises right now that we're holding on to as we walk through our daily lives, there's a promise of Christ's return that should bring us hope as well. Where we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So it, the hope that we have, it's not about us. It's not about our own uh, strengths, our own abilities. Our hope is because God, who gave us all of his promises, is faithful and just. Even if we're faithless, the Bible says he remains faithful because he cannot disown his own. And then everybody, if, if you've been a Christian for two days, you should have heard this first. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to, uh, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. <laughs> Psalms 33, 18 says, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who whose hope is in his unfailing love. So my question for you today is, what are you hoping for? First of all, do you know Jesus? Have you ever asked him to come into your heart? Because I know before I asked him to come into my heart, I tried everything that I could possibly try, and still there was a hole. There was an emptiness. I couldn't be a good husband without Jesus. I couldn't be a good father without Jesus. I couldn't be a good employee without Jesus. I couldn't be a good son to my parents without Jesus. Is there something that you're struggling with in your faith today? Are you faced with a problem and you don't have the solution? Are you helpless in a current situation? I'd like for us to do something a little different for the ending prayer time this morning. If any of those pertain to you today, if there's something that you don't have an answer to, we're going to finish with a song and we're going to stay in our seats. The song's name is In Jesus' Name and it's by Katie Nicole. And if you're struggling with something, one of those areas something that you don't have an answer to, you don't have a solution to a problem that you're facing, I just want you to slip your hand up. 
And then the people that are around you, that are near to you, that are close to you, that love you, I want you to pray for the person that has their hand up. And then at the end, I'll go ahead and pray corporately to finish our service. We need to understand that even when we're helpless, we don't have to be hopeless. Jesus is the answer that we need. And he may not give you that answer right away. And if you remember in the, in the New Testament, when Paul said, uh, God, I have this thorn, it's in my side. We don't know what it was, but it was painful and it hurt. And he didn't have the answer to it. And three times Paul said, I went to God and I said, God, please take this thorn out of my side. And what did God respond back to him? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So when we're completely helpless, we're completely weak. But that's when the power of God can move. So if someone does slip their hand up and they want you to pray for them, pray this. Pray that they would have more of God's grace and pray that God's power would move in their weakness. In Jesus' name by Katie Nicole. I speak the name of Jesus over you. And if you don't have anybody with your hand up around you, pray for me. You're struggling with something and you need prayer. Let the people around you pray for you. You don't have a solution to the problem that you're facing. My wife and I are going to be grandparents this year. We've never been grandparents before. We need prayer.
I'm trusting and believing that whatever need you had this morning when you walked in here, that God met it. Let us pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've brought us through. Thank you for uh, the light that you shine. Thank you for wisdom from above. Thank you for allowing us to be your hands and feet. Lord, sometimes we're the answer to someone else's problem. So just give us an awareness. Allow us to walk circumspectly, as the Bible says, that we could see the needs around us. And Lord, if there's healing in this room that needs to take place, Father, that you would just give someone your special touch today. If there's hope and encouragement that someone needs today, Father, I pray that you would give them hope and encouragement. Lord, if there's a financial need, your word says that you can open up the storehouses of heaven, and we've seen it. Thank you, Father. Whatever need they have, you already know what we need before we even ask and open our mouth. Thank you for loving us that much. Thank you for times that we feel helpless, that we don't have to be hopeless, that we can fully trust in you, that you're still on the throne, that your hand will continue to be upon the Pastor JJ and Pastor Kenneth and the teenagers and, and the helpers that went with them. And their hand will be upon us as we travel. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Have a great week. God bless.